Hi, this is Steve. B6WZ. Let's talk about highly directive receive antennas and the sometimes problems that can arise with a very narrow uh, beam width. Do some antenna modeling. I'm going to talk about RDF and uh, the pros and cons of some different antennas, uh, both uh, beverages, uh, single wire, broadside beverage, phased pairs, as well as the nine circle uh, receive array. For antenna modeling, I use the program called 4NEC2. It's available online and it's, it's uh, freeware, though I would encourage you to donate. But boy, what a great program. And uh, I found it to be very useful and uh, generally suits my needs for all of my antenna modeling. Uh, this is the program I've used to derive the numbers, which I'm going to show uh, in a minute. In fact, here on the uh, right, this is what's, uh, this is a uh, geometry edit uh, pane window. And you can see in this case, I have a two element uh, broadside phased uh, beverage pair uh, in the program. And I'm going to actually calculate while we're sitting here a uh, far field pattern for the 160 meter band. Um, the, um, the program, though, is surprisingly easy to operate. Um, I'm not going to go through it here, but, you know, I, as I say, I encourage you to download it and play with it. Maybe I'll make another video um, afterwards here just to outline some of the basics of uh, running the program, uh, especially for use in antenna modeling. Uh, I've used this not only to model beverages, but also my uh, nine circle array. So here we have the output. This is the zenith plot of that, uh, this very array shown to the right. And, uh, um, and then we can also uh, look at the, uh, the azimuth. Uh, plot. Uh, one other thing to notice here in the display to the left, this is the main panel, and you'll notice here it actually computes RDF, the received directivity factor. That's actually an output uh, parameter for the program, which is very handy uh, for the purposes of what I'm going to talk about now for uh, receive antennas. By the way, um, one thing that's really handy with this, I can um, uh, change this from geometry edit to the neck editor. Uh, and now if I edit the input file, you'll see that it's all tabulated. So in this case, you know, this, these two wires are spaced 400 feet apart, but I can easily just change those numbers, the 400s, to any spacing I want, do a rerun, and uh, get a, be able to compare things. So that's what I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to show a number of uh, runs done from 4 and Act 2, uh, starting with uh, uh, this one, which is a single uh, beverage wire, 918 feet long, or 1.75 wavelength. Uh, that's about uh, the same, the length of all of my wires uh, that are uh, yeah, currently deployed at V6WZ, and they're all uh, modeled at 10 feet above the ground, which is also uh, fairly close to the nominal height of the wires that uh, that I have out there. All of these displays are the same. In the middle here is the actual uh, screenshot from uh, Fornac 2, which again, as I showed uh, earlier at the bottom here, the RDF will be quite uh, though I've also put that on the main panel. On the left is the zenith plot and on the right is the uh, azimuth plot of course. So here's a single wire and this is a broadside pair that is spaced 200 feet apart um, and you'll notice that here the RDF has improved uh, to 13 dB uh, and you'll notice that the beam width has uh, become a little bit narrower. Uh, while I go through these, you'll notice that the zenith plot uh, doesn't really change a lot. In fact this one is a 400 foot spacing uh, two broadside pairs and the RDF is now increased to 14.1 dB and if we go to 50, 500 feet spacing uh, we're up to an RDF of 15.2. I have heard uh, indications that once you get uh, really beyond even 400 foot spacing uh, there can be problems uh, with respect to phase um, phase inconsistencies uh, between the wires because they're actually physically so far separated that uh, even though you're phasing them in phase, the actual signals aren't aren't as in phase as they uh, they should be. So in truth, I don't use uh, 500 foot spacing, although the modeling would suggest it's pretty spectacular. I uh, typically well, I am using in the field 400 foot uh, spacing. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to line them all up, one over the other, just so you can see what happens. And um, so this is the single wire, as I first showed, at 11.7 R RDF. And as soon as we uh, add a second wire and phase them uh, in phase, uh, you'll notice that, first of all, we've gained uh, 3 dB. And that, of course, is now because we're combining two antennas. In the modeling, I did properly allocate the power. In other words, uh, you know, if the single wire has one amp, the two, because they're split, I put a half an amp on each wire. But, in, it, but still, because they're, they're broadside phased, uh, we do increase the gain by uh, 3 dB. Um, so uh, here is the 400 foot uh, spacing of the two wires and the 15, uh, rather the 500 foot spacing. Of course, it's quite obvious that you can see that the beam width is narrowing uh, all the time here. And of course, that's why 
the RDF improves because RDF, the received directivity factor, is entirely a function of the you know uh, ratio between the the forward maximum gain and the average gain from all other directions. That's why these antenna. That's why RDF is effective. You want to hear more noise in this direction and diminish noise in all other directions in the uh, 3D uh, space. So. Anyway, so what? Well, um, the reason I got onto this is um, let's look at. Uh, I started to look at the, e, the European coverage from my existing uh, receive system here at V6WZ. Uh, this is a you know an image from Google Earth of my QTH with all of my beverage wires, which extend out out into the forest. But for the moment, I'm going to remove all of these wires and just talk about my two wires that are to Europe, generally speaking. That is, I have one phased pair going north at zero degrees and one phased pair going at 45 degrees uh, to, to Europe. Well, originally, I only had one wire uh, going to north and one to Europe, and I've since added the phased pairs. Well, it's about a year ago, but, but um, with, with these single wires, there wasn't an issue, but now there kind of is an issue. Uh, and that's because if you look at, uh, if I put those same plots from Fornec2 on this plot, uh, you'll see my north pair is looking like this, and my Europe European uh, pair is uh, looking like this, and we kind of end up with this gap. And if you'll notice, it's kind of in the peak, it's down almost four, well, almost four and a half dB, uh, right in this notch between the two. Uh, and, you know, in, in fact, it's a range of two and a half to four dB down between 15 degrees and 30 degrees. So on the one hand, you'd say, well, so what? But here's the thing. Um, this is a great circle map that I, uh, I have that's centered on my QTH. So this is the bearing uh, from my QTH to, uh, to Europe between 15 degrees I've highlighted and 30 degrees, that notch. Well, when I look at the map, I mean, right in the middle here, we've got Norway and Sweden and Finland and Estonia, Latvia, uh, Poland, Romania, Belarus, uh, the Ukraine, Moldavia, uh, you know, even Bulgaria, most of Bulgaria and Turkey and even some of um, European Russia is kind of in this gap. So my feeling was that perhaps this would be worth uh, trying to uh, trying to remedy. Uh, so I, I, what if I just put another uh, uh, pair, uh, uh, similar pair, uh, 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 pointing to uh, 21 uh, degrees? So this is a map of what I plan to do. Um, so in red is shown the two new pairs that I'll, I'll install, which are basically at 21 degrees, right between the two existing pair. Uh, you know, this could be a lot of work, but what I um, decided to do was, um, if you'll see here in yellow, this is the existing feed line, which uh, goes to the two existing 45 degree European beverage pairs. And this is the uh, phase box in the middle. Uh, for the new wires, rather than put in a whole new uh, phasing system, um, what I've decided to do is just add uh, two 160-foot uh, coax feed lines. And then uh, by putting a control voltage on the, uh, the coax feed lines, I'll have a relay box at the feed point to, uh, to select the, these equal length extensions that will, um, will go to the new beverage system, uh, the new beverage wires, uh, you know, try and minimize a bit of the field work. Fact is, you know, it's still going to be a fair bit of work uh, in terms of tree clearing and putting these wires out. But I must say, based on my experience, and I'm going to talk about this a little more uh, near the end of the video, uh, that extra even two, let alone four dBs, um, I think is definitely worth it. And from what I've seen in the experiments I've done this winter, I, I know it's, uh, it's going to be worth the effort. Plus, I don't know, I, I think it's kind of fun uh, doing antenna work. So one thing I'd also like to do is talk about my nine circle array and talk about some comparisons and benefits uh, compared to beverages in particular. Uh, though I'm talking about a nine circle array, those just would apply to any of the uh, many other small footprint uh, vertical arrays. Uh, again, in Fornec2, it's very easy to, to model the nine circle array. Uh, this image to the left is out of uh, uh, the YCCC uh, array a manual uh, uh, designed by John W1 Fox Victor. And, um, you know, this describes the ideal phasing that's been um, put together for the three elements that make up the nine circle array. And putting that in the modeling program, you, you end up, we end up with an RDF of 12.1, uh, which is, 
pretty darn good and a very nice uh, clean pattern from this uh, small three element array. And in fact, this is the um, azimuth uh, uh, plot of that same, same array. But as I just showed, um, you know, heck, uh, you know, I've got this problem with, uh, with the, the, the broadside pairs. There's no question that this is kind of an issue, but, you know, with my 400 foot spaced pairs, I mean, this has an RDF of 14.1. So, you know, it's almost 2 dB better than the nine circle array. Um, which, you know, is beneficial, there's no question, but, you know, we end up with this problem. Whereas, if we look at the nine circle array, uh, you know, my pointing north versus pointing at 45 degrees, we do not have that problem. There's almost no uh, overlap gaps with the nine circle array. So there's no question, this is a, this is a serious uh, benefit to the nine circle array. And furthermore, uh, if we look at the nine circle array uh, with an RDF of 12.2, what if we compare that to a beverage? So a single wire beverage, this is the 918 foot long single wire beverage. It only has an RDF of 11.7. So, okay, it's, uh, you could say it's less than the nine circle array. I mean, within that range, I'd say they're equal. Uh, but actually, the nine circle array even has uh, a, a, a broader... Uh, 3 dB uh, beam width. Uh, so I would submit this, this is a real argument for the benefit of these small uh, vertical receiver arrays. Um, you know, they're, uh, you know, they, this, this is a real advantage to, uh, you know, to, uh, especially compared to some of your broadside phased arrays. I've talked a lot about RDF and I just wanted to share my thoughts on that here. You know, why do we put so much effort into RX antennas? Well, why do some of us do it anyway? You know, what I found and I want to talk about is that the RDF metric really does work uh, for evaluating receive antennas. Basically, more signal, uh, less noise. You know, basically, it's like cupping your hands and your, uh, around your ears to hear a distant sound. Like, it really does work. I mean, you know, you're, you're eliminating noise from everywhere else, but just focusing in the one direction. Um, in fact, uh, what is received directivity factor? I do have a separate video I made on this, but you know, it's very simple. It's a ratio. It's a, it's a, the received directivity factor, but it's a ratio between the maximum forward gain and divided by the average total gain in the full 3D hemisphere. In fact, this is out of 4 and act 2. In fact, on the left is the zenith plot, but we can look at the plot in 3D. And this is a 3D uh, image of this same, same antenna. So what the modeling program does is it, of course, could calculate the maximum forward gain. In the, in the case of Fornic 2, I think it takes the, the elevation angle at the peak maximum forward gain, whereas some, you can also calculate RDF at a specified wave angle, which would give you a slightly different ang uh, answer. But nevertheless, we take the maximum forward gain and we divide that by the total average gain in the full 3D hemisphere. In other words, somehow the modeling program computes every angle, not from the, from the back, the top, the sides, and little points all over the entire 3D hemisphere and averages it uh, so that we're computing the difference between the gain from the front and the average gain from all other directions. In other words, it's a simple factor of saying how much rejection, what is the ratio between the rejection of noise from all directions compared to the front lobe. In other words, it's not just front to back, it's uh, front to all directions. And the less, the more rejection you get from all directions, the side, the top, and everywhere else, the better. You're gonna get more signal, less noise. Something I've heard quite a few times is, well, my QTH is so quiet, I don't need receive antennas or special receive antennas. Well, I'm really not so sure that's true, and I'll, and I'll tell you why here. Um, uh, my QTH is actually a very quiet uh, rural uh, QTH with mostly uh, uniform atmospheric and propagated noise uh, from all directions. I mean, I do have a few uh, bad uh, directions on specific frequencies, but generally it's uh, uniformly distributed in all directions. Uh, and I find that my high RDF antennas really do uh, improve copy uh, significantly. Um, and, I, and I'll give you some example, or show you, I'll explain to you why I've, why I've noticed, how I've been able to derive that or determine that. Because, well, specifically, I've been able to test with my broadside pairs. And, and I can do testing to show that, you know, even an extra 2 dB uh, can make the difference between uh, copy uh, and no copy. And I can do that uh, with literally uh, instant uh, A, B, 
testing. Uh, and the way I'm able to do that is I have configured uh, my uh, broadside beverage pairs um, with uh, a relay at the uh, phase box, at the matching box between the two pairs, there's a relay which can uh, toggle between either the pairs being phased or individual wires. And otherwise I, could, I can select either wire individually and listen on that or uh, listen to them uh, phased. And in fact, here's, uh, here's an image of the uh, flex uh, radio um, on the computer. Um, to, to maybe just to help explain what I'm getting at here. Uh, in fact, this was uh, one morning on 160 meters and you can see on, 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 the, on the waterfall here, I've, uh, you can see Kevin, VK6LW signal is showing. You can see his trace here uh, calling CQ and to the left there's Kim, uh, HL5IVL calling CQ. His signal was a lot better. Uh, this image, uh, is uh, is listening on the phased 400 foot spaced pair pointing directly uh, west directly at at Kevin now what I have noticed in the past in fact when I first installed my beverage pairs I, I at first thought there was a problem and the reason I say that is because I expected that because there's 3 dB of gain with the pair compared to the single wire I expected that when I went from a single wire to the pair that I should see a 3 dB increase in the noise. Well, here's the thing. There is no change in the background noise at all when I add the uh, pairs together versus a single wire. However, in the case of Kevin's signal, this is with the pair. If I were to listen just on one wire, in fact, I'll do a zoom in here. This is a zoom in on his signal. So you can see he's fairly light, but he's a good copy. If I were to switch to just one wire, his signal level would drop. The background noise, the, pan, the, the waterfall would look the same, but his noise would drop. Well, that's because the forward gain is just dropped by 3 dB. Um, conversely, if I'm just listening with a single wire and then switch, into, switch the uh, second wire in as a phase pair, his signal pops up. So, you know, that is an increase in RDF and it does indeed make a difference and it can make the difference between copy uh, and no copy. Even if you're in an extremely uh, quiet remote QTH, you know, the fact is there's still going to be distant propagated noise, atmospheric noise, or even distant uh, man-made noise. I mean, to say there is no noise, I mean, I don't know, is there really zero noise coming from anywhere else on the planet? Like none? I, I think that, you know, there's always propagated noise. And so focusing the receive antenna in one direction only and diminishing all of that propagated noise from all other directions, it, well, it, it, it simply has to improve copy. I mean, it's called more signal, less noise equals a better signal to noise ratio. Uh, you know, one other thing is, you know, sure, I mean, there is a possibility of ending up with TXRX imbalance. I mean, yes, I won't argue that, you know, in other words, you know, perhaps, you know, I can copy lots of DX, but they can't hear me. So what's the difference? Well, you know, you know, perhaps, you know, there's times when it might be good to be able to hear the background antenna guy with only 100 watts in Europe. Uh, you know, I, I can hear him and hopefully he can hear me because I'm, you know, I'm uh, running higher power with a directive transmitter array. Anyway, 73 guys, have fun. You know, hey, go build some receive antennas if you can. They're, frankly, for me, it's just a lot of fun and it's something to do. 73, B6, WZ.